All right, guys, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to have an introduction to the VI and Vim editors. And in order to understand where Vim comes from, let's have a quick history lesson of VI and Vim. So, the VI editor was developed starting around 1976 by the engineer named Bill Joy. He was a graduate student of the University of California at Berkeley. Bill Joy later went to help found Sun Microsystems and became the chief scientist. And then later, around the year 1991, the developer by the name of Bram Moulinar wrote Vim. And Vim is a clone of VI with many additions that make it far more intuitive and a lot easier to use. So let's get started into why you should know VI or Vim. VI is present in every Linux and Unix operating system. And it's super lightweight, and it's an editor that will always be there. So any Linux or Unix machine that you find yourself in a terminal, you will always have an editor there that you're familiar with. Also, VI and Vim, they're both very powerful. You can make sweeping changes to large documents with a few very short commands or key clicks. Now with all that said, let's go ahead and get started in the editor. All right, guys, there's something I want to make clear. Um, we, wanna, we had a history lesson of both VI and Vim because a lot of the later distributions of Linux, for example, the version of Ubuntu I'm running now, VI, if you type VI in the shell, it links to Vim. For example, if I type VI, you see it says Vim improve, and it's linked to Vim. So that's something uh, that will happen in a lot of the later distributions of uh, Linux, it seems like Vim is kind of replacing VI and uh, more some of the more modern distros of Linux. Anyways, let's go ahead and take a look. So um, there are several different ways you can open a file for editing in Vim. For example, you can type Vim or VI, the file name, for example, test.txt, and you see we created a new file called test.txt and if we exit this and do just vi i can open a file like this i type semicolon you see the cursor flashing here at the bottom i type o and then test.txt and it's open this file and this file doesn't exist so it went ahead and created it so there's something i want to go over for you guys, there's several different modes for Vim. And this is going to seem a little crazy at first and a little confusing, but Vim has different modes to control how you move about the editor. So when you first start the editor, like so, we see the introduction screen here where it just gives you a little information. And um, when you first start the editor, you start in what is called command mode. So if you are to type any keys or anything, um, those keys, all the alphanumeric keys are linked to commands, various different commands in Vim. Um, you can look at the help menu here to see what a lot of these commands do. For example, if we were typing J, it wouldn't insert J into the editor, but instead it would move the cursor down one line. Um, I would show you, but there's no text in this file. Or say if we were to type DD right now, it would delete an entire line because we're in command mode. And so um, another mode that you will use more frequently will be the insert mode. And in order to get to insert mode, you push I. And you see here at the bottom, the cursor says insert. And now the keys will all act as you would expect them to act. You can basically type uh, anything and you can push, uh, you can tab and all that type of stuff. For example, and yeah, and you can push enter, go down to a different line. And as long as it says insert at the bottom, we are in insert mode. And in order to exit insert mode, you simply push escape. You see insert disappears. And now I can move the cursor up and down, but I cannot 
insert any more text into this file unless I go back into insert mode because we're in command mode. And as I said earlier, if you were an example of a command that's available in command mode is the DD. Um, and that will delete an entire line like so. And you see these lines down here that have tildes. Um, these represent lines that will, excuse me, these are, these represent lines that where there is no data at all. Basically, these lines don't exist yet. And you see above the tildes, where I'm able to move my cursor about, these are actually blank lines. And so we could delete lines like dd, 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 etc. And so another type of mode you have in VI or Vim, it's called last line mode. And to get to that mode, when you're in command mode, you type colon. And you see the colon appears down at the bottom of the screen. And you'll want this mode in order to open files, close files, and write files and exit the editor. For example, say we want to um, say we want to quit the editor. The command to quit would be once you're in last line mode after pushing the colon key, you would type Q and that will quit the editor. And you see the editor complains here because it says there was no last write. Uh, this is a safety feature of this editor. It will not let you exit the editor unless you're really sure. And the way to do that would be you go back to last line mode by typing colon, you type Q, and then you force it by typing an exclamation point. And that's like, yes, I'm sure I want to quit and I don't want to write this data. So let's go back to our test file here that doesn't exist yet. Let's insert some data. And we'll hit escape, we'll leave insert mode. And now when we're ready to write this file, we'll go back to last line mode by typing semi, uh, excuse me, colon. And then we can do W to, and that is the command for write. And you see it's here at the bottom, it says test.txt was written, it was a new file, there's one line and there's 44 characters that were written. And now we can quit. And there's something that's pretty cool about the last line mode, which we were just in. Um, say we edit this file a little bit more. We can combine some of the commands in last line mode, like so. We can do a write and a quit on the same, as the same command. And now if we open our file up, you'll see that it, writ, it wrote our new information into the file. So something else that's pretty cool, um, the, this editor allows you to do search and replaces. So for example, say we wanted to replace the word sum with um, maybe a word like stuff. Or here, let's try Ubuntu to make things more interesting. Um, we'd enter last line mode by typing colon. We type S to signify we're going to do a search and replace. We type forward slash. And then the word we want to match is sum. We type forward slash again because we want to replace all the sums with Ubuntu. And then type forward slash again and G. And what this will do, it will find all the all the strings throughout our file where it says sum and replace with Ubuntu. And the G signifies we want this to happen on every line. For um and for our example, we only are using one line, so you know the G isn't really that important, but let's try it. And as you see, all the sums became Ubuntu. So that's one of the cool features that makes this editor very powerful. Also, we can easily search through stuff. Um, once we're in command mode, which we are in now, we can type forward slash and say stuff. 
And now you see the editor is, um, or the cursor is flashing on stuff because that's the first match for our search string. And if we push in, it will go to the next one. So these are just uh, a few basic of the, a few basic commands that we have here in the VI or Vim editors. Um, I will include a manual with a list of some of the helpful commands and how to go about navigating to this editor. This one's called Nano and it's uh, quite easy to use, a lot more easier to use than uh, say Vim or Emacs. So in order to get started, let's go ahead and type Nano. And so here we are in the Nano text editor. Uh, it works pretty easy. It almost works just like a, a desktop text editor. Um, you see where the cursor is blinking, you can just start typing right away. Go to the next line. And you can easy, easily move back and forth um, with the arrow keys. And also, um, you see all the all the shortcuts are listed here at the bottom, and um, what this means this this uh, caret character means control then the letter. For example, say if we want to cut some text, we could do the control K, control K, and then when we want to uncut, it's control U. It's kind of like cut and paste. And it also has a it has a great search and replace feature. Say we want to search to replace all the dat. We want to replace dat with what? And then we do a for all. And you see, that was pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward. You didn't really need to use a regular expression or anything like you might need to use in Vim. And then when you're ready to exit, it's Control X, as you see listed down here. So Control X. And it asks you, um, when you're ready to exit, it will ask you if you wanna save or not. And so if you wanna save, just go ahead and do Y, and it'll save your changes. And it'll ask you for a new file name. We do an ls we see my new text file and then say we want to open it again it's as easy as that and there's also an undo and a redo feature um, i definitely recommend this text editor for new linux users it's very easy to edit configuration files and whatnot moment to share um some of the graphical text editors that are available on the Linux operating system. I know the past few videos, we focused mostly on the command line text editors. I just wanted to show that there are graphical um, text editors very similar to Windows that will make you feel right at home on the Linux desktop. All right, so let's get started. Uh, the first one I wanna show you is called Text Editor. And if you're used to Microsoft Windows, you'll be very familiar with this editor as it resembles the notepad on Windows. And if you look here, it looks almost exactly like it. You can type whatever, all the same keys work. Um, there's nothing special here. It's a very basic editor. Um, you can actually change the fonts here. You can change the tab width, etc. You can open recent files. Um, it's very basic and very straightforward very intuitive to use. So we'll go ahead and close this. And um, another editor that's available and the Linux distribution, if you choose to install it, is the LibreOffice Suite. And this is very similar to Microsoft Office. It can also edit any file through Microsoft Office as well. And you can save in those formats as well, which is very helpful if you're opening files on Windows. So let's find it. 
And so of this suite, um, this is the writer application where it obviously resembles Microsoft Word. Um, it can do almost everything Microsoft Word can do. For example, you can type stuff and you can change the fonts. It has a few extra fonts that might not be available in Microsoft Word and also vice versa. Oh, here, let's change that. Yeah, there we go. You can change the font, change the font size. Yeah, you see you have headers, you can add bullets and whatnot. Let's add some bullets here. Yeah, so this editor, very intuitive. Um, for a new user, maybe you'd prefer using this over using something like Vim or Nano or even Emacs. Um, but uh, this is something that's not default installed on every Linux distribution. So that's why it's still very important that you know Vim or uh, VI. So that's it for this. Basically, in the shell, a wildcard matches any character, or in some conditions, it matches any character or more. So, for example, say here in the shell, I wanted to delete um, several files. Uh, I could use a wildcard, such as an asterisk like this, or a question mark like this, to match... Uh, different characters in a file name. So here, let's take a look at what I have in this directory. Um, let me change directories here. Okay, so I have several uh, mp3 files and I have a bunch of files with a .txt extension as well. So say if I wanted to delete all these music files or mp3 files um, that were uh, have a, a number in the file name and the number is greater than 10, I could use a wildcard like so. And so using this question mark here will only match one character. So in this case, it would delete all the music files that are greater than 10. And so if we take a look now, you can see here that um, all the music files over nine, excuse me, I said greater than 10 before, I meant greater than nine, um, have all been removed here. Um, and so the question mark wildcard matches only one character. For example, say if we were to do this. This would delete all the music files with a number um, with only one number after the hyphen. Um, the other wild card that we have here is the asterisk, which matches one or more characters. So say if we wanted to delete all the music files, regardless of what the extension was, as long as the first part of the file name matched music uh, hyphen file hyphen, this asterisk here or this wild card here would match the rest of the file name, regardless what characters are there. So. Let's test this out. This should delete all the music files. And now you see from our LS that all the music files are gone. So let's, um, let's play with the remaining files here. You see here we have, um, we have text files with a number and then text files with a number and a TXT extension. So Here's something interesting we can do. We can combine the wild cards. For example, say if we wanted to remove text files um, 
Here, I just want to give you an example of how the question mark will only match one character. We could say remove T question mark and then file question mark. And this should delete all the text files without a .txt extension that have a number less than 10. So we'll do that. And you can see like text file one, text file two, all the way up to nine have been removed. So those are the two main wildcards, the asterisk and the question mark. And there are, there's one more wildcard that kind of gives you an option. And those are the brackets like this. So an interesting way to play with this is um, say if we wanted to remove um, different numbers or say if we had, um, here, I'll just give you an example here. It'll be easier to show you. So let's try to remove text file dot txt and let's do one, two, three, four. And it should remove all these files right here. The, uh, the text file one through four. And if we do an ls, you see those files have been removed. So this also comes in handy, say if we had, um, if we wanted to remove file names that we we weren't sure if it was lowercase or or a capital letter um, we could do an option like that for example say if we weren't sure if a file had a capital a or a lowercase a we could match both of them with a wild card like this so the wild cards come in handy and are very useful uh, around the shell when you want to do move and manipulate files um, in the command line. And this is a basic overview of how to use wildcards in the shell. So I'd say to you, we're going to go over pipes and have a review of the grep and sort commands, as well as possibly the unique command. Anyways, a pipe, which is this key right here, is um, it allows you to direct the output from one command to another. But before we get into playing with pipes, let's review a few of the other commands that we're gonna need to use for this example. Remember the command cat that we went over in one of the earlier videos? The command cat outputs a file. So let's take a look at what files we have in this directory. We have this file called fruits. And you can see we use cat and it outputs uh, the content of this file. And fruits contains a list of fruits. And uh, we'll go over the command grep. The command grep, spelled like this, G-R-E-P. Um, it finds uh, matching patterns within a file or within um, the input that you give the command. So. To play a little bit with pipes, say we wanted to find a particular fruit in this fruit list. Um, say we wanted to find all the fruits that had the word fruit in them, in the name. We would do cat fruits, and then we'd pipe the output of this command into the command grep. And we'd use grep to search for fruit, and that would only print the lines that match uh, this pattern we're searching for, fruit. And you see the shell does a nice job of highlighting the matching uh, string that it found. So let's take a look at one of the other um, lists we have in this directory. We have one called vegetables. Oops, let's use cat since we're going over cat. So we have a long list of vegetables. Um, we could use a pipe here to find all the vegetables that have the have squash in the name. Let's try that. And you see the shell once again did a nice job of highlighting it. These are all the vegetables in this list that have squash in the name. Some of these vegetables I've actually never heard of before. 
So let's get into the sort command. Um, sort allows you to sort the output of another command or the output of a file um, alphabetically or numerically, depending on how you're, you know, what arguments you give sort. And the cool thing about these pipes here in, um, in the shell is that you can combine multiple commands. So say we wanted to cat the vegetables, um, find the ones that have squash in the name again, and then sort that alphabetically. Oops, forgot grep here. And look at that, we have, you know, it's, it goes alphabetically. We have acorn squash, banana squash, butternut squash, gym squash. And so that's pretty cool. That's a perfect example of how we can use pipes in the shell. Um, let's take a look at what other files we have. We have uh, this file called numbers, and it's just uh, a list of random numbers ranging from one to nine. Um, there's another cool sh shell tool or terminal command line application called Unique, which reports or omits repeated lines. And if looking at the output of this file called numbers, you see we have a lot of numbers in it that are repeated. So here's something we could do. We could cat numbers and we could pipe that into this command called Unique, U-N-I-Q. And if we just do it with no arguments, it will make sure that we, I'm oh, sorry. What I meant to say is if we do this and we add the C switch, it will count how many times a number reoccurs. And you see um, the one appears allegedly once, uh, five appears once, four appears twice, eight appears twice, and then one's in here again. I believe one showed up multiple times because there was white space behind the one. So it was treating that uh, as a different character. And then you see there's a blank down here and it says it's one. That's because there's a, um, a blank line in this file. But anyways, back to our point of pipes, we can group several different commands. Um, we can group the output of a command into the input of another command and so on and so on using various pipes. Sometimes uh, you'll see um, people who are manipulating files in the, the shell group, um, write a massive one-liner that has like maybe six or seven different pipes to different commands. So using pipes in the command line will make your life a lot easier. So let's do a quick review again. Let's cat fruit. Let's grab for, uh, let's look for a pattern AP, apple, grapes, and grapefruit. And then I think that's already sorted alphabetically, but let's try to sort it. And yep, I uh, was, oh, well, yeah, grapefruit comes before grapes if we sort it alphabetically. So yeah, that's a perfect example of how pipes are used in the command line shell. Basically, an alias is like your own shortcut to a command. Um, basically, you can write your own one-liner and uh, create your own alias for that. Or, for example, in the last video we went over pipes, you could have an alias to um, a command piping to another command. Here, we'll uh, take a look at aliases right now. So... In order to see the aliases you already have set in your uh, shell, just go ahead and type alias. And you see I have this alias called alert that calls notify send. I have an alias uh, for E that calls vim. I think that was an accident. And then so on and so on. So say if we wanted to call the command uptime. And by the way, this command uptime just says how long your systems have been running for and what the current load is across the processors. Um, you see, it's showing that information. 
This machine's been up for five days. Anyways, um, say if we wanted to create an alias for it, we could do alias, uh, we'll call it u equals um, single quote uptime, single quote. And now if I type u, you see it's a shortcut to the uptime command. Um, here's a maybe a useful alias. Uh, let's take a look at LibreOffice. I believe it's writer. Yeah, so the LibreOffice uh, command with the writer option opens the LibreOffice uh, Linux desktop um, text editor. And so that's kind of a lot to type. So what we could do is create an alias. Let me close this. Create an alias for this. We'll do alias equals um, doc. Over here, we'll do this. Alias doc equals LibreOffice Writer. Okay, now when we type doc, you see it opens, um, it's a shortcut to that command, uh, LibreOffice. So let's go ahead and close this again. And let's look at some of our files from our previous video. And say, um, here's an example where we can create an alias that calls uh, um, a one-liner of commands that are piped together. We'll call this one, um, uh, let's call it melons. And let's have this cat or uh, let's have a cat this file in my home directory. Cat fruit, and we'll have it pipe that into grepping for melon. And yep, that looks good. So now we type melons. Uh, we get melon. I could have swore there were more melons in this file. Actually, let's take a look. No, I guess that's it. Here, let's create another alias called uh, fruit. And have it grep for all the fruit that have the word fruit in the name. Okay, now if we type fruit, yeah, and so there you go. Um, an alias is basically just your own personal shortcut or your own personal command that calls another command or a series of commands. They're pretty easy to use and they can save you a lot of time around the Linux shell or terminal by shorting, shortening your um, commands or one-liners. Anyways, that's it for this video. Please tune for the next one. Thank you and bye-bye.